Okay, part two. Efficiency. Uh, entropy. And the second law of thermodynamics. And heat and things. So, what do they all have in common? Well, they all have heat engines in common. Okay, so this is a crude abstraction of what a engine is. Um, it gets to the core of what all engines do. No matter how complicated they are, they all do this. And this is sort of a pictorial representation of a closed and isolated system that is composed of a hot reservoir and some temperature TMH and some cold reservoir at some temperature T of C. T of H greater than T of C. It's not just composed of that though, it's composed of that and some work duct, and that's the whole system. So, this abstraction reflects an observation by Carnot and others of his time, but th that, that essentially all engines um, uh, do what this paints, what this describes. So, um, um, Carnot being of the industrial age and interested in steam engines, he was naturally interested in how efficient he can make those steam engines work. And so he understood what we understand, the old story of a steam engine. You got a furnace and coal, uh, you heat up the furnace, it's real hot, um, and then that furnace we call the hot reservoir, and then you make that heat meet with some water that's at a temperature that's colder, the cold reservoir, and the water turns to vapor, it expands, goes through a tube and stuff, and then pushes a piston, and then that pushes the train forward, doing work. Great. Let's try to understand that. Um, so, this is the whole system. Uh, it's of an engine, like of a train, so yeah, we figured it's gonna do some work. But let's just look at this part. Um, so let's just look at this two parts without the work being done. With here, you have part of the system that has a temperature T of H that is higher than the temperature T of C. And by the way, at this point, like, that's T of H, T of C, it could be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be so extreme as like the difference between a furnace that's, you know, hot and some water. Anything in between. Or it could be that, the furnace and the water. The only, the only thing is that T of H is greater than T of C. And I think there's a picture in your book. Like this is the red and this is the, I don't know, the green. These are buzzing by faster, and these are not so fast. And then, like, you take out the partitions, and they they sort of meet. And a bunch of particles hit a bunch of other particles. And, you know, we're going to macroscopic. Macroscopically, what is happening is that some heat is being transferred. Um, and if this were, say, 
back to the water, uh, how you would calculate this transfer of heat is you could just look at the water part as your system and the heat as the environment outside transferring a certain amount of heat. We've done this problem before. It's transferring a certain amount of heat and all you have to do is measure the temperature of the water in the first place uh, and then you s and then all you have to do is uh, go uh, like a uh, bup 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 you know what I mean by this graph this is uh, T and this is Q um, um, so ice uh, water so it's be it's somewhere between here. You get its boiling point. Um, uh, transfer more heat, the heat of evaporation. Um, uh, and then probably get once you that once you're past evaporation, uh, there's probably more heat that you can do to get it to the temperature of the coal. And so, by the time, so you measure the, the water temperature, um, uh, and then the vapor temperature, M cat, and then plus, 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 you know? And that's the amount of heat that was transferred until, um, um, at which point they're both at the same temperature Let's call it Tm for T middle, somewhere between T and H and T of C. And so, the definition of entropy, as said in your book, it is a measurement of the dispersal of energy. And so, energy was dispersed. It was mostly in the hot region. And not so much in the coal region. And then it was dispersed. That's what it does. And that's the second law of thermodynamics. Energy tends to disperse itself. Entropy tends, the change in entropy tends to increase. Um, but I think we're going to microscopic. You gotta remember that Carnot was the guy who sort of um, um, helped come up with the concept of entropy. But he wasn't thinking about energy dispersal. He was trying to prove that you couldn't have a engine that was purely efficient, that was 100% efficient. And so he came up with the concept of entropy to be able to prove that. And it turns out that um, it's called the Planck Statement of the Second Law of Thermodynamics. No. Um, yes, the Planck Statement of Thermodynamics, which says that you can't have an engine that's completely efficient. So, um, it turns out that the tendency for energy to disperse itself is equivalent to um, saying that you can't have an, en an engine that is um, completely efficient. And so that's what Carnot showed. And so in showing that, um, he sort of, we well, I don't know if he did it, but like we, we have this pictorial graph that has an arrow pointing downward or Q of C, which represents heat waste, heat that's lost. So,
go back to this right here. So in this case, you know, you open the partition, the water met with the coal, and energy was dispersed. That's what happened in the engine. But then the engine, through some clever way, um, remember how I told you, like, can you imagine a box leaping to motion? Well, it could do that if all the particles randomly went in this direction. But that's very unlikely. And by unlikely, and, and I say unlikely because um, the second law of thermodynamics is at its core. And this is just sort of alluding to statistical mechanics, a statistical law, a, a law that comes out of pure statistical properties. So this is, that could happen, and if they all went in that direction, then the box would be pushed in that direction. But they don't do that normally. What they do is that uh, they go in all types of directions randomly, and their net force on the on the on the surface of the box is zero. Well, this motion of all the particles that that that, that make up the internals of the system. Well, we know what that is. That is thermal energy. Um. So in this crazy case that I. Uh, sort of told you, uh, the thermal energy found a creative way of transferring that thermal energy to work, with forward mechanical work. And that's what an engine does. You take the hot reservoir and you make it meet the cold the cold the the cold reservoir and there is an a a transfer of energy but instead of just sort of transferring energy and then cooling down and and reaching equilibrium no while you're transferring that energy i'm going to try to find a way to take that transfer of energy and turn it into mechanical forward motion. And given this point of view, you might think that's pretty difficult, but like given what you know about a steam engine, we actually know how to do this. I mean, if you think about it, what does a steam engine even do? Like it takes all these random moving particles, the vapor that just got vaporized, going like that. And it, it jams it through a tube. And then what's going on in the tube? All the particles are going in one direction. In one direction. Pushing against a wall. In one direction. So, essentially what the engine did was find a way to get all these particles to go in the same direction. Okay. So I took, a, I took advantage of this transfer of energy that happened when I met a, a hot body with a cold body. And to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Carnot said to himself, it seems to me that um, uh, to be able to, uh, um, uh, to be able to get a thermal energy and transform it to work, you're gonna need this sort of, um, um, looking at this, this setup, a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. You know, it kind of makes sense. Like, in the hot reservoir, like, yeah, they're zooming about. There's a lot of energy there, but again, they're all going in random directions, and overall, it's not really being used. And so, um, 
like if you want to go in this direction then then the, the ones going in that direction sure more or less keep going in that direction but the other ones can you decelerate change directions slow slow down reach zero change direction that's what the cold reservoir does it slows down the particles so the ones going in that direction sure go ahead keep going in that direction but the other ones they need to decelerate and go in this direction so visualization there but essentially to get work you need to be able to transform um, a thermal energy to work you need a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir um, um, and what happens is this which car not proof this is not a proof but this is what happens this is the story you have the hue of H from the hot reservoir and then there is a certain amount Q of C that is transferred to the cold reservoir. Okay? I mean, technically, all of the Q of H is transferred to the cold reservoir, right? Um, uh, and the, the, the water just... And then it goes to the piston and it goes into work. Um, and it does work and so that bit that was turned to work we'll call it W um, um, but there is another bit as the story goes that's not a small number in fact that gets um, a transfer to the cold reservoir and we call this energy uh, waste energy. So, again, this system is an abstraction of a heat engine, and it's closed, and it's isolated. And so, also this process of the transfer is a reversible one. That is to say, it's gradual, Ideally, and it's continuous. No, 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 no sudden, no sudden uh, burps of work or heat. Sort of like keeping that steady, so that the process, the thermal process, can be gradual. I mean, reversible. Otherwise, it'd be irreversible. That allows for us to say that the energy is conserved. That is to say, the internal energy, U, um, uh, is constant. Delta U is zero. And so, by the, sec by the first law of thermodynamics, since delta U is equal to Q minus W, moving the W to the other side, we get that Q is equal to W. And so, I'm gonna be talking about efficiency, and I'm and I'm gonna say that like, you know, it's not perfectly efficient. Not all the, you know, thermal energy was transferred to uh, was transferred to work, and that that had to do that that is, you know, uh, basically a phenomenon that we have uh, titled um, the second law of thermodynamics. So I want to specify that that's not to say that we're going to break the first law of thermodynamics. This is an isolated closed system. This is a reversible process, gradual and continuous. So delta U is zero, so necessarily all the thermal energy will be transferred into work. 
But what is that thermal energy? Well, that thermal energy is composed of Q of H minus Q of C. Q of H, you can see it as the heat coming from the heat reservoir, and Q of C as the heat that goes into the cold reservoir. And so, and then, and that Q of C is, um, um, is, we call it the weight energy. We have this diagram here. We have Q of H pointing into the heat engine, Q of C pointing out of the heat engine, and W pointing out. Um, and so, what's it called? If Q is equal to W, then this is also equal to W. Which gives us that, taking this part, Q of H is equal to Q of C plus W. W is the work done by the system. We're talking about a train, so this term W is a very good way of seeing it. Indeed, looking at this equation, uh, what's it called? We sort of understand how great all that information is encapsulated into a diagram. We have Q of H here pointing inside of the engine and we have these two parts going out and so what goes in must be equal to what comes out. And what comes out is work and some heat waste. I mean yeah, waste of heat. And I made it that way. Well the book made it that way. The book imposed it because it wanted to say that in this transfer of heat and in this case, imagine this is the train, forward motion, but like to do the forward motion it has to pass through this, through this process. It kind of has to go through here then through here. Some QC gets left behind. And that's what Carnot's statement was, that you're, you're going to have some QC that's left behind. And so looking at this term efficiency, we can see what that means. Q of H is the, the heat from the heat reservoir. It's kind of like the, you can see it like as the total heat. I know that could be maybe confusing when you consider this. Um, uh, It's the heat from the end from the furnace. Um, like you would love for all that heat, all that motion of all those particles to perfectly transfer to work. In that case, as you can see, um, uh, if you look at this equation right here, which is this equation, but just W equals Q, QH minus C, W equals QH minus C. If QC, if the waste energy is zero, then W is QH. And if W is QH, then W divided by W equals one. So that's like perfect efficiency. But Carnot said, you can't have perfect efficiency. You're always gonna have some waste heat. QC is never gonna be zero because energy disperses because energy tends to disperse well yeah but they're equivalent so you can also say the opposite energy tends to disperse because you can never have pure efficiency remember if and only if goes both ways they're equivalent. Um, um, and 
I I feel like that's all I can say about this. Uh, I guess what can I what can I say? I I guess it's it's important to consider what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, you know, when you figure out an abstraction that is consistent and well defined, which is this graph, then you, you have to use it to your advantage. And so that's what this is for. And so a very straightforward explanation would be QH is equal to QC plus W. Can't you see the arrows? Um, uh, uh, and and indeed, indeed, like when you're when you're trying to solve problems, like uh, like that's all you need. You need to know what goes in and what goes out. But um, I guess there are some details that are interesting to consider. Um, what else? Oh. Another statement of the second law of thermodynamics, uh, this time, by the way, uh, energy tends to disperse is the microscopic, um, uh, but also microscopic point of view of, um, of, the, of the second law. Um, uh, there is no such thing as a purely efficient, uh, there is always going to be some uh, waste heat, so W will always be smaller than Q of H, so this will never be one, it's never be perfectly efficient engine. That's a statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Another statement of, of the second law of thermodynamics is that, which has to do with what we're talking about also, is that um, heat is transferred from a hot body to a cold body spontaneously. Uh, a thermal energy is transferred from a hot body to a cold body spontaneously. And the key word is spontaneously. Because we do know of an example where it's not true. Uh, well, not the statement, but uh, heat is transferred from a cold body to a hot body. And that example is a refrigerator. But the key word is spontaneously. It doesn't do it spontaneously because it requires work. And to understand this work, to understand what a refrigerator is, look no further. Refrigerator. And that's it. If you put the name, it's it. No. <laughs> You have to flip this one. Flip this one. Flip them all. Okay, so heat is transferred. I don't know if you can see this arrow. This arrow is pointing up. This arrow is also pointing up, and this is pointing in. So, okay. Uh, he is transferred from a cold body and into a hot body. What? But not spontaneously. If you do so, then you're gonna to need to put work into it. And that's why we have this W go in there too. And so, um, uh, so we flipped all the arrows and it should be uh, equivalent. So this is essentially a thermal system. that follow the first law of thermodynamics and also the second and, and also the third but and also the zero but explicitly the first and the second and more explicitly the second um, and so I invite you to go back to your book read how the refrigerator um, actually does this process this part's easy, electrical energy, work. And, but then how does it do this transfer of energy? And it has so much to do with what we talked about when we sprayed little water particles in the air 
and like why does that cool it off? And why does that increase entropy somewhere else? Um, um, what's it called? And you know, there is a similar process to the, I mean, obviously it's similar, I just, look how similar it is to the steam engine. But it, it even goes even more similar, except this time it's a coolant, like a coolant liquid, some chemical. Um, there is a compression and decompression of that liquid done in order to transfer heat but not to do work it, it its object is its goal is to actually transfer the heat and it actually takes in work to do so that refrigerator ain't going anywhere like there's a joke again like have you i don't know you better catch your refrigerator that's the punchline anyways um, um that's uh, all i have to say about um, entropy, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which I'll say it again, uh, energy tends to disperse, uh, entropy tends to increase in the universe, um, uh, uh, a purely efficient machine uh, engine is impossible, um, uh, and energy tends to, uh, I mean thermal energy, uh, heat transfer goes from the hotter um, uh, object to the colder object by that I mean the one with the higher temperature to the one with the lower temperature um, spontaneous Spon that's the keyword spontaneously we got to notice the refrigerators in the room um, and all those statements are equivalent uh, bonus proves that they are equivalent. That's an interesting uh, problem, and uh, it's a little tricky, but it's not that tricky, but it's a little tricky. Um, so, oh, and Carnot, our friend Carnot, he proved that, um, that this, so he sort of demonstrated this law of thermodynamics logically. And he did it with the term, with the with the value of entropy. He came up with entropy to be able, to be able to like he didn't understand entropy at the molecular level. He didn't know what entropy in terms of uh, dispersal of energy necessarily. He knew it in this term. He knew it in like like no such thing as an efficient engine. Um, but he came up with the with with the term entropy to be able to show that there's no such thing as an efficient engine. By the way, he came up with um, this thing. Delta S is equal to Q over T. That's what he used. And that's in your book. The change in entropy is equal to the added heat to the system divided by um, uh, the temperature of the system. Uh, sometimes you take the final, sometimes you take the initial. I saw in the book, sometimes they suggest taking the initial when it was very small, but I usually take the final. Um, uh, and so, in the book, you have questions about how to figure this out, and it's pretty straightforward. The Q is the same way that we figured out all the other ones. Uh, and the T is the one they ask you for. Plug it in and you find the change in entropy if they ask you that.